Welcome. This is episode 7 of Dripwood. Dripwood is an Afrikaans name for a traditional pot. We'll show it to you right now. We are three Afrikaner friends uh, who love to chat about hunting. Um, Jan is in Perth in Australia. Jan, welcome to the program again. Thanks, Tani. Valentin is in the capital city of South Africa, Pretoria. Welcome, Valentin. Hello, Tani. Uh, Valentine also has today, I'll introduce the guests to us just now. Valentine also has a drip with, with him. Valentine, just show it and talk a little bit about that, please. Yeah, so Donnie, this is a, this is just a small little quarter pot. So this is a, a three-legged pot that we, uh, the name comes from. Uh, we usually use these, these small ones just for a bit of sauce, but usually it's a, quite a big, a bigger one. So this is a quarter size. Uh -huh. Usually the regular one is about the number three size, which is which is much bigger, yeah. Okay, so that's the three legs. So the one leg is in Australia, one is in Pretoria. I'm sitting in Athens, Georgia. And with me, I have two guests, Jaku uh, van Ikerk, who sits in the beautiful wine country of Stellenbosch in South Africa. Welcome, Jaku. Thanks, Tony. And also in Pretoria, Margulai Rickert. Uh, welcome to the program, Margulai. Um, so, Margulay, I think you might be muted. Margulay, say good. Yeah, it's a good Yeah, it's a good Jaku is going to talk to us today uh, about some food, not the drip word specifically, but about food. But first of all, today we will discuss children, especially poor children in South Africa and a beautiful project in South Africa that combines hunting and giving to poor people in South Africa. Uh, the program is called Help Yach. Now that is an Afrikaans word which translates into English into help hunt. So hunters who help. Margulay, will you please, and I know uh, all of us, English is not our first language, so you must bear with us, uh, specifically also with Margulay, who works in Afrikaans every day and all day. But please give us some information about the Help Hunt project. Thank you, Donny. Yes, um, Solidarity Helping Hand started the Help Yacht initiative in 2018. Uh, for the past four years, we were uh, supported by the public, especially hunters, um, and we were able to distribute more than 30 tons of venison um, uh, right over the country. So yeah, it's a it's a nice initiative where we help uh, <laughs> needy needy children. Yes. Needy children. Children, yes. yeah, needy children, especially toddlers. Fifty-six years old. Yeah, so um, it's a great initiative. So, so um, the hunter goes to the hunting field, and I think we all know that we want to hunt extra game, <laughs> and the budget doesn't always allow it. Sometimes our wives don't always allow us hunting extra, but now we can. Now we can do that. We can hunt extra. The farmer also wants extra game hunted because he gets extra money, and that game gets given to helping hand and you feed needy children, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Give us some statistics, how many, how, many, how many kids, is it countrywide, national, yes please? Yes, it's a national uh, project, so it's 8,000 toddlers um, wow. over South Africa, yes. And um, what's nice of the project, we did some, some research and um, like for instance, a kudu can, can feed 40, 40 toddlers for a month, Long. So yeah, okay. it's, a, it's a nice project. Yeah, we did the, 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 the game types a little earlier on and com uh, compared them to the American types of game. So kudu is quite a big animal, but it feeds 40 children for a month long. And then obviously Roebok and all those others, is different types yeah. of uh, numbers there. And, and you say 30 tons of meat going to 8,000 poor children. And this is the poorest of the poor children. These are, these are not children that, that often don't get food at home. Is that right? Yeah, um, sometimes it, the, the meal that they receive at the school um, from the Solidarity Helping Hand um, the Lunchbox Project, um, it's the only meal for the day. 
So, so this is very important for us to, to uh, it must be a nutritious meal. So there must be protein, there must be vegetables yeah. on that plate. So yeah, it's very important. Wow, okay. For the public to help, uh, so uh, they must go to the website, is that right? Um, and make a donation like people in Australia and America watching this program, they can make donations on the, on the website, is that right? Website is helpyach.co.za. Um, there's, there's a button where you can um, uh, make a donation. Or if you are hunting South Africa, you must um, donate some, some meat. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, so I think it's the easiest for the Australian and American viewer to just go and donate, donate. some money um, because you also have uh, costs to get the food to the kids. And that'll, that will help uh, Helping Hand to do that. Thank you very much. What a wonderful project um, our viewers are encouraged to, to support. Uh, we will put the website down again, helpyacht.co.za. It's not easy to, to know how to, to spell Helpyacht, but we will put that yeah. into the, the this description. Yaku. Um, so Yaku is a guy who did um, took tourists onto the beautiful Orange River, where he had to feed them properly and wonderful wonderful meals with little uh, equipment, no kitchens available. Yaku, um, so tell us a little bit how long have you done this and uh, uh, a little bit more detail about that, please. Um. Dania, I suppose with, uh, yeah, with, as with all outdoor things in South Africa, um, grew up spending a lot of time outdoors and then ended up guiding on the Orange River for about two and a half years. Um, took people on river trips downstream in, in, uh, in the Richtersveld, a very beautiful desert part of our country, um, on four to six day trips. Um, and the only way to cook for your clients is on an open fire. So... Necessity dictates how you're going to cook for them. Um, middle of summer, it's about 45 degrees centigrade. I don't quite know what that is in Fahrenheit, but yep. yeah, I think it's 115 degrees in the shade. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, you come up with some creative ways of, of making food. Um, yes. So specifically for this program of, of Donny, he asked me to help him um, just show you guys some food how to prepare food when you go out hunting. In other words, you don't want to do a, a you don't want to make a, 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 a lot of fuss. You just want to have something that you can do on the coals while you're brying your meat that you just killed during the hunt. And um, yes. so to that end, can I, should yes. I do a quick question? Please, so please is, demonstrate for us. This is just a cabbage that we, um, we cut, I, I just did it a, a while ago for Donnie, but I'll, I'll show you guys again. We just cut it nicely into a, a cross shape into the top of it so you can open it up. Um, and then we put as much Marmite as we can fit in there. Now Marmite, um, <laughs> there's a lot of debate about this, but Marmite is really, it's a thick paste of, I don't know, black stuff um, <laughs> that, <laughs> that's good for you and it tastes yeah. like it so it, that's about as much as i'm going to say about it yes um, so but, we we push it in there and we push it in with our hands as deep as we can into these leaves as well you know it, you, as mm -hmm. you flake the, the cabbage you can you can push it in everywhere mm -hmm. um, and then some brown onion soup okay you add a lot of the, uh, you can empty the packet out into it and then just add that into into the mix um, that serves to absorb some of this, this natural juice, the, 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 the juice that's inside the cabbage itself, um, giving it a nice flavor. So then we would typically wrap it in two runs of tin foil. And the idea is you don't want any of the juices to seep out. Um, so we want to wrap it in one direction and then flip it over, grab some more tin foil. and wrap it in the opposite direction. So there's where I folded that one. Now I'm just gonna yeah. wrap it in the opposite direction. That means any, any juices will be kept inside. Um, and once I've made a nice ball, it's ready to go onto the fire 
turning okay. every five minutes for at least half an hour, depending on how hot your fire is. If it's a, I don't know what kind of wood you guys have in America that you that you can braai with. If you do it on charcoal, then I mm -hmm. suppose uh, go a little bit longer. Uh, um, mm -hmm. So then I suppose 35 to 40 minutes. You can feel when it starts getting softish, then yes. it should be ready. When yeah. you open it, be sure to open it inside a bowl mm -hmm. like that so that none of the juices seep out. So you want to then open the, the, the cabbage in the bowl, chop it up and serve it hot. You don't want to have this when it's after it's cooled down. So make sure that you time it nicely to, uh, to, to be ready with the food itself. Yaku, show us the um, just show us the the product Marmite, please. So that I mean, it is available in America. There are lots of South African stores. Also, a, a chain called Kroger has an international island. I, I do believe. Yes, thank you. Show it nicely there, Jan. What is the Australian variation of Marmite? It's called Vegemite, but it's got a sweet taste to it. Where uh, Marmite's got a, a salty taste to it. And it, uh, as far as I can remember. It's just a, a vegetable extract. It, it boils down all parts of vegetables and still only the paste is left. Okay. So well, um, if you if you like a, a salty or a sweet version of that cabbage, you need to pick the right the right one. I think you guys might have several products, Donny, that you can uh, pick from. Yes. Uh, Bovril, etc. Yes. 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 Yaku, and uh, so you said about half an hour, and then it'll be ready. Yes, yeah. Chop it up after half an hour, serve with a bit of salt and pepper, and off you go. 100%. I know some American hunting friends are going to do this. Definitely healthy also, not just meat, yeah. meat, meat every day. Uh, Valentine, it's good to, <laughs> to come back with a little bit of vitamins in the body too, you know. But it's after a, yeah, no, after it's a long time. It's, it's at its best when had, when had with a little bit of red wine, especially red it's wine true. from the Stellenbosch area. This is um, a bottle of Cinso of uh, a friend of mine, Gavin Brevet Rats, the B Vintner. So to be found on the internet as well. But uh, South African wine, any South African wine is, is brilliant to be had with this dish. Excellent. Yeah. And that too, you can get in the island at Kroger, you can get South African wine. So go out and get some, some wine from the Stellenbosch region. You will not be disappointed. Um, <laughs> Okay, thank you so much for that also. We are now switching over to suppressors or silencers. Jan, what, do they, what are they called in Australia? Silencers or suppressors or both those names? Dani, both the terms are used, uh, but unfortunately it's only theoretical because we can't own silencers or suppressors in Australia at the moment. It's forbidden by law. There's a very selected, uh, selective group of people that work for the government that can own them, but they all need to be serialized and registered. And it's a heap of paperwork and it's just a, a general pain in the backside to try and sure. uh, get hold of a silencer around here. Um, I think the guys are probably influenced by sort of the, the Hollywood version of what people think a silencer is and can do, unfortunately. Um, I think there's many advantages and uh, maybe Valentin can tell us a lot more about that because he can actually own them and use them and probably have some of them. Yes. Valentin, tell us all about the, the situation as far as silencers go in South Africa, please. Yeah, so, so in South Africa, it's, it's much more difficult to own a license, a gun license than in the US. So I think it's <coughs> a little bit easier to own one in Australia, but we are, we are fortunate enough that we can buy silencers off the, off the bench. So we have a bunch of different um, products available, um, some of them locally made, um, and we import, it's imported as well. So we get a huge variety of, of choices, which is quite nice. Um, yeah, silencers became popular the last couple of years. Um, there's a lot of hunters um, using silencers specifically um, and as well, um, there's a lot of just guys shooting, shooting targets um, at, at the range that uses them as well. Um, I, I enjoy using a silencer as well for hunting purposes specifically. Um, I think the benefits outweigh the disadvantages way more um, um, for me, so especially when it comes to hunting, 
And even these days, we have a, we have, we have a lot of farms or a bunch of farms that actually um, um, you, you need to have a silencer on your weapon to be able to on, hunt on that farm. So okay. it became popular and I think it's a good thing to do. I, I enjoy it um, for two or three main reasons which should be is um, the, the sound, the less sound um, it produces, so that helps with, with, the, with the decibels, it takes them down, which is quite nice. Um, but the recoil, especially in, in the larger calibers, is, is way less. Um, so you can shoot, shoot much more at the range without mm -hmm. um, getting a sore shoulder or whatever. But mm -hmm. um, for me, especially when hunting um, at closer ranges, um, that's when that's when you actually see the best difference because you can actually hear when you, when you have shot the animal and you can see the difference in um, the, the antelope how they, they they don't get that disruptive mm -hmm. um, compared to shooting without one so I enjoy it um, and like I said um, it's it has a lot of benefits for me. Jan, could you tell us a little bit about the recoil specifically? Because that's attractive. Um, how much, let's say, 30 odd six, 308, and you suppress it, how much less is the recoil percentage wise, maybe? Johnny, uh, I'm not 100% sure of the percentage because it's going to depend on the type of silencer you got on there and the size okay. that it is. Okay. You get them in different sizes, and they, it can make a, a difference uh, to various degrees. Um, I think. You know, it, it does make a significant difference. Mm. And uh, as far as the recoil is concerned, and it takes away that very sharp noise that a lot of people are very, uh, uh, they're not used to the, the loud bang. Mm -hmm. And it makes them shoot worse. They, every time they, they fire a shot, it sort of surprised them and give them a bit of a fright, you know. And, and I think specifically for those two things, it, it makes a huge difference to the results you see on your target. Furthermore, it might do a uh, little bit of improvement on accuracy because uh, the, the projectile doesn't touch the silencer anywhere down the line. And the gases that escape behind the projectile is slowed down and contained before it leaves the silencer. So it, it makes everything run a little bit smoother. Um, there's a, a little bit of disadvantages to it. it, it uh, it'll, uh, the, the sound, that you don't hear because it is contained in the silence, it turns into heat. So if you fire a, a number of shots, you know, in, in quick succession, the barrel will heat up significantly more than when you shoot without a silencer. Okay. But there are, are heaps of advantages, as uh, Valentine said. It should be a no-brainer around here. People are making a lot of noise uh, about um, noise pollution on the one side, but on the other side, they won't allow you to use a silencer, which is completely counterproductive. Yes, yeah. Now look, that nanny state of yours, Jan, we can talk, for, uh, but that'll be a <laughs> discussion for a whole <laughs> different day, how they, I mean, it's wonderful organized society, but man, they control you guys like crazy, isn't it? Yeah, if we, we, we want to have that discussion, uh, I think Jaku need to send me a case of that uh, bottle with a B on it before we start talking about this. <laughs> to be a gun, a gun shop owner in Australia, it's like, a, it's like a minefield almost, you know, to have to jump through all the uh, administrative hoops that they put in, pl in your place. It is a bit frustrating, Danny, but uh, the, the thing is, they say these are the things that you need to do, and if you do it, you know, they, they sort it out. It's not something that they uh, they do. I, I think the people creating those rules genuinely believe that it'll make a difference. Unfortunately, a lot of the people that I think that, that make the rules are not experienced shooters and uh, they don't have all the, the practical um, experience yeah. that will help them make better decisions uh, that's, that's uh, make more logical sense to a, a shooter with years of experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I do want to come back to you, Margulay. You better get your English in line. You have shot one of the most antelope, most beautiful antelopes in Africa. Tell us a little bit about that, please. And then second, yeah, tell us about which animal did you shoot? Yes, um, Donnie, I was fortunate enough to go on a hunting trip with uh, two of the project's ambassadors. One of them are the well-known 
Rafi play a Bucky Sweta. So yes. you helped me a lot. Um, yeah, and I, I shot a kudu uh, with a 270 glider. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Now, that was a great experience. Wow. So, I mean, all of us here would love to shoot kudu with a blazer. 270. It's, imp- I mean, I have maybe, t- Jan, do you have some blasters in your shop? I do have one at the moment. Ah, you see how exclusive that is. Now, the Australians will know Bucky's Bueta, but the uh, Americans do not. Now, if you can imagine a 260 pound, six foot eight world famous rugby player, that was the almost the guide that Margulay had. And the other one was this famous singer. Is that right? Yes, Adam Tass. Adam Tass. Also yeah. a local singer and songwriter, yes. Yes, and they are the ambassadors. Uh, you cannot ask for, for better ambassadors for a wonderful project such, such as, as your project. So that, that is wonderful. Mm-hmm. So thank you so much, everyone. Suppressors, silencers, Yaku, thank you for the cabbage. That is wonderful. And as I say, I know one or two American hunters that will look at this show and definitely will try the cabbage. All the best there down in Stellenbosch in the wine country. Have a lovely time. Thank you, Donnie. Margulay, all the best with the project. I hope that everyone that watching this program will consider donating uh, to the Help Hunt project, Help Yach project, and may it go from strength to strength. Thank you, Donnie. And the regulars, I will see you next week. Jan, there in Perth, have a wonderful day. Thanks, Donnie. I just can't say goodbye without commenting on that lovely folk art behind you. Those, uh, those two star-spangled banners look really nice there. Oh, thank you. It was Memorial Day in America. Monday, we uh, celebrated uh, fallen soldiers. So it was flags and so on. So I dusted off my standard six uh, woodworking skills and made these two flags. Wow. So thank you for mentioning that. I wonder what grade a prop uh, would have given me <laughs> for a standard six woodwork project but anyway uh valentine capital city pretoria thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on the silencers today thanks nice speaking to everyone today speak soon